Welcome to Renegade Inc., the talk show which allows us to think differently. It was the American writer Mark Twain who apparently said, by land, they're not making it anymore. A year before Twain died, Winston Churchill said that land monopoly is the mother of all monopolies. Land is a necessity for human existence and remains the original source of all wealth. Yet bankers, economists and politicians have simplistically lumped land and capital together, so apparently now they mean the same thing. Practically, this doesn't work. It's why inequality and poverty rages on, and it's also why never before in human history has so much been owed by so many to so few. In 2016, the new Duke of Westminster inherited a £9 billion estate without a tax bill. Not his fault, it's how the system is set up. Because we, as a society, have chosen to eliminate land from the economic calculus, it's possible that these fortunes can be amassed. Joining me to discuss why we no longer think about land as a factor of production, let alone a unique one, are the writers and economists Laurie McFarlane and Josh Ryan Collins, who along with Toby Lloyd co-authored Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing. Welcome to you both. Uh, firstly, congratulations uh, on the book. I know Toby can't be here. He's New Zealand bound. Massive effort, so well done. This idea of the uh, missing factor of production, or just riding roughshod, excuse the pun, on, about uh, over land and not factoring it into the economic calculus. Why? Why have we, why have we missed it? One of the most interesting things that we've uh, sort of t touched on in this book is that land, uh, specifically as a factor of production, as long as political economy has been an area of discipline, was at the, really at the forefront of the, uh, of, of the ideas of the early forefathers of political economy. So people like Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, David Ricardo all recognised that land uh, is absolutely essential to the process of uh, production uh, and distribution of uh, wealth. And that's the, so the three um, factors of production, land, labour, capital. Yep. And they understood the importance of it. But what's happened? Over time, uh, we go into quite a bit of detail actually as to the, the evolution of the discipline of economics effectively. Um, and uh, round about the turn of the 20th century, the neoclassical school of economics really began to develop and really overlooked land as a distinct uh, factor of production. Uh, and in particular, what that did is obfuscated um, the role of economic rent uh, within economics. Right. This is the moment where everyone can get into conspiracy theory, but was it um, a, a group of shady landowners pushing that factor of production out, or was it that people just thought, well, you know what, it's not relevant anymore? I think one of the things we tried to tease out in the book uh, as very, very important is that land itself and private property and land uh, is inherently bound up in legal constructs and legal frameworks and therefore the rules that govern land uh, ownership use uh, in the economy are inherently political and these rules around land have changed immensely not just over time but also change uh, massively between countries right. and the rules that govern that have a huge impact on the incidence of economic rent so it's the ability of people to uh, extract wealth and income not by contributing anything to production but simply by owning a scarce natural resource and being able to exclude others from that and then charge people access to that. The ultimate monopoly. Yep. I think what the founding fathers, the classical political economists, Smith, Mill, Marx, they recognise, I think, that if you're going to deal with land properly as a factor of production and its unique properties, as Laurie was talking about, you have to sort of get political. The state has a role to intervene, uh, to prevent the excessive accumulation of unearned income and to prevent distortions in the economy from that. And they felt, you know, a sensible way to do that was to tax those rents, basically. Neoclassical economics, as I said, end of the 19th century, what they were interested in was trying to develop sort of quite universal scientific, so-called scientific theories of the economy that weren't subject to these kind of more normative political interventions. They wanted to identify rules of supply and demand that would apply across all the factors right. of production. So broad brushing yeah. and not, and not yeah. paying uh, specific attention to a unique factor. Yeah, so, so John Bates Clark essentially elided together, conflated land with a broader, sort of fairly vague notion of a fund of capital. He kind of said, all of these factors can all be monetized effectively. You can put a, a pound or a dollar sign behind them. That's the way a businessman thinks. 
That's the way economists should think. Right. And it didn't really matter that land, for example, is essentially really fixed in its supply in contrast to most capital goods. You can create more of them if there's more demand. Land, you can't. It's, it's pretty much fixed. And in comparison um, with labour? Well, you can substitute capital for labour yeah. to some extent, so there's some sort of flexibility between those two uh, factors. But there isn't really a substitute, easy substitute for land. I mean, you, you've, you need physical space to produce stuff. And even studios like this, you, you still need the, the space, if it's, even if information communications technology. It's amazing, that one seemingly innocuous act from John Bates Clark of conflating land and capital, because ultimately what he's saying is, well, it's all GDP, it all goes towards uh, the figure, a, a, a numeric figure. Just after the 2008 crisis, we caught up with a Nobel laureate, Joe Stiglitz, and said to him, well, what about real estate? And what about land and it, the role in, in the crash? He said, it's got nothing to do with it. And this is a Nobel laureate, right? And you've looked at all the subprime stuff in America and, and the private debt, the stuff that's happened in Japan. Ultimately, land speculation ends uh, or derails every economy. Mm. What, what's your view on this, having written the book? When you talk about land to people, um, particularly in the context of the economy, it has this sort of con connotation of sort of old agrarian or agricultural societies. Well, they should and be out there telling it. Exactly, that's the kind of picture that comes into mind. And I think the, the, what we're trying to do with this book is to show that actually uh, land uh, is absolutely vital to some of the key problems facing modern advanced economies, even in the age of you know, the internet, smartphones, at the core of some of the main challenges. So things like housing crisis, things like financial instability, booms and busts, like you say, not just in the UK, but in other parts of the world, most of the time, the large booms and busts that we've seen at the core has to do with the real estate cycle. Um, similarly as well, the productivity sort of paradox that has been talked about at the moment of low productivity. Uh, one of the things we touch on in the book is the link between um, excessive uh, allocation of capital towards the financing of already existing assets, so uh, land and real estate, and that they're sort of crowding out actually allocation to productive investment. In the real economy? In the real economy, exactly. You talk about the housing crisis, there can't be a more emotive issue. Right. Well, let's just um, look after the tenants for a second, uh, if you will. Adam Smith says, as soon as the land of any country has all become private property, the landlords, like all other men, love to reap where they never sowed and demand a rent even for its natural produce. He's speaking the truth, isn't he? Mm. Absolutely. Um, and when you look at the housing crisis and specifically the, the rental sector, just in the UK, we can go global, but just in the UK, it's a mess. Is it not? Yeah. Uh, he's right. What, what would you say around this uh, to those tenants who are out there going, I I'm drowning, not waving? I think we are actually getting near to a tipping point in the UK where uh, fewer and fewer people actually are able to afford to buy a house. And the balance between renters and homeowners is changing. You know, in, in somewhere like London, it's forecast in a couple of years, there'll be more renters than homeowners. And even those people that do own homes are realising that their children are never going to be able to own right. homes th in the way they do. And some of them are lucky enough, they can just pass down the money through the generations. But it, it's increasingly recognised it's not sustainable. So uh, ultimately something has to change politically um, to avoid a crisis. Now, what that change will be is difficult to say. We propose in the book a number of, of different options. But the difficulty is it's not just about people needing home places to live. It's about the wider economy. It's right. about the fact that the whole of the UK and many other advanced economies is sort of basically plugged into this feedback cycle between the value of property and housing, uh, propping up consumption and propping up the wider macro economy and propping up the banking sector as well. It's not just a simple political issue. It's a wider economic issue. Let's just talk about one which I think is a particularly pernicious bit, um, which, which is also structurally determined. And these are the big house building companies. And the fact that in 2016, they returned over 1.5 billion uh, pounds to shareholders. Um, you have to ask, was that through building houses? And when you really dig down and look at the data, it wasn't through building houses at all. It was through land banking, strategic land banking, I think it's called. When the sort of Taylor Wimpies of this world and others, Barclay Homes, etc., strategically land bank and then pull those profits out and redistribute them to shareholders. The societal effect is pernicious. 
How do you begin to address that? The fundamental thing that we need to be doing is to sort of de-link uh, the supply of housing from the volatile uh, market in land. It's fascinating, although data on land is very hard to come by, which is one of the problems uh, in the UK, we tracked different data sources back in time and you see that prices in land boom and bust up and down and that's what's really driving the prices of, of, of housing. Um, so fundamentally, if we're going to uh, address this issue, we need to be delinking the supply of housing from the volatile land market. Uh, and there's various ways of doing this. One of the ones historically which has is, which is done that successfully is, is social housing where you know, it's just publicly owned um, and the rents are, are, are based on affordability rather than the, the, the market. There are other more interesting ways that are appearing now. Uh, we talk a little bit about community land trusts, for example. But fundamentally, your point is right in that at the moment when you have a handful, which is a handful now of private developers who are really building most of the houses, the reason that they do the land banking actually, apart from anything else, they would argue it's to mitigate the risk um, and to sort of control the supply of land such that you don't get these big swings and the extent that they can sort of release land as and when it's necessary. And the other interesting thing, it's actually very hard to tell how much land that they actually own because a lot of the land that they have is actually through things like options with farmers and right. things like that. So it's not necessarily as if they actually have it on their balance sheet, but they have agreements. So there's like a, sha there's a shadow land market. There's a shadow land market, exactly. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah, part of the issue here is, is just lack of transparency is exactly what's going on. Um, maybe the, the, a moment um, where Mr Osborne didn't privatise the land registry, maybe you can point to that in history and say that was the moment where actually things started to go in the right direction. Josh, 45% of London sites uh, with planning permission are owned by property companies and they don't build homes. Developers don't want to build. There really isn't an incentive for developers to build according to the needs of the population. Right. The, in, the incentive is to buy land, hold on to it until it they either get planning permission or that it reaches the, a price that they're happy with and then build some houses, but always to maintain the value of the land. And if you sort of overbuild in their, in their eyes, land value prices could fall. And share prices fall at the share same time. Share prices could fall. So we're sort of locked into this, this rather you know, perverse low supply equilibrium. And this is why you know, land cannot be viewed simply in this sort of supply and demand market equilibrium approach that, that mainstream economics has. It has to be viewed as a commodity with unique properties, um, fixed supply, and it has to be regulated effectively, and the state has to play a, a major role. Or, or, you know, it has to be bought and sold for not-for-profit purposes as well as simply for, for profit. When, when these developers are making these kind of profits and, and you've gone through the trawl of data, I mean, and then you see the social effects. I mean, I look at it and I'm sort of head in hands. When you see people who can't get on with their lives and the people who can very well get on with their lives and have an incentive to, to keep doing this. And really, it's the, surely the issue of our times. One of the key issues of our times is this dividing line that is increasingly uh, driving a wedge between two different types of people in society, effectively. On the one hand, there are those who have a stake in the uh, land ownership, effectively, uh, and that's homeowners, but it's also people like developers as well, uh, and there's those who don't. Um, and when you have a, a situation where the value of land is increasing, and we're talking about there's a whole host of reasons uh, why this happens naturally, but is, is massively uh, emphasised through the financial system. Um, on the one hand, if you happen to have a stake in that and you happen to own some land, um, that, the increase in that increases your net wealth. Through the wealth effect, it increases your consumption, and through things like equity release, it can increase your actual spending power. The flip side of that, of course, is that for those who don't own land, uh, that means that they see the rents going up, uh, and actually, is, since about 2002, any increases in incomes for the bottom 60% of earners has been completely wiped out by increasing housing costs. So you have the increase in rents sort of eating away at that. And of course, if you, if you are hoping to try and be able to buy a house, that means you're going to have to save more in order to get a higher deposit. So it's this wedge between those who own land and those who don't, which is really driving society apart. Progress and poverty. Someone wrote a book about that once. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for this half. Join us after this short break when we'll be asking Laurie McFarlane and Josh Ryan Collins how you bring land back into use for the benefit of society, not just the select few.
Welcome back to Renegade Inc., the show that allows us to think differently. Before we talk more about liquidating the land monopoly with Laurie McFarlane and Josh Ryan Collins, let's have a quick look at this week's Renegade Inc. index. We start with our favourite tweets, first one from Generation Rent, at Oz Property Scam, which tells you roughly where they're coming from. Uh, in the last seven days, the median asking price for a Sydney house increased by $14,700 to a all-time record high of over 1.3 million Australian bucks. It looks like it's it's in trouble. I mean, I, That's a statement. That's a big <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, and I know people like Steve Keen have been predicting a, a big crash for, for quite a while. I mean, the fundamentals look look really dodgy there. Uh, at Jeffrey Sachs, we tweeted him, Professor Sachs, we said, uh, what is your view on rent seeking? And he said, the US political economy is now built on rent seeking in finance, military industrial complex, healthcare and fossil fuels. Um, we tweeted him back saying it's edifying to hear such honesty about rent seeking in the US. This is surely where to focus attention. He said our political system has been utterly corrupted. Both parties, it's a disgrace and a huge cost to the American people. Our headline of the week, which you don't often do, but we found this uh, on the Daily Telegraph premium section, and it's from property doctors. I don't quite know what a property doctor is. And here's their question. Can I become a buy-to-let landlord with a budget of £300,000? Answer is probably, or you can go and set up a decent business that actually adds value to society. Our book of the week this week is Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing by Josh Ryan Collins, Toby Lloyd and Laurie McFarlane. Now, as we said, Toby can't be here, uh, but this gives you the opportunity to pitch the book. So you get, I think they call it in tech land like an elevator pitch or something, but I know it's a 10 seconds or something. I, it's a stupid thing, right? I've never sold anything to anyone in a lift. Josh, have a go. If you want to understand, you know, why you or your kids aren't going to be able to buy a house uh, in the near future or possibly ever yes. in this country, I think this is a book that will really help you understand that more than any other. Perfect. Done. <laughs> Laurie, why does every coffee table, library, school and university need this? If you want to understand some of the main challenges facing uh, not just the UK but many advanced economies, things like growing inequality, um, growing intergenerational divide, stagnating productivity and the housing crisis that Josh just mentioned, then this is the book. Excellent job, fellas. Great pitching. We liked it. Uh, and you'll sell millions. Now, this brings us to Andrew Keith Walker. This week, he is literally in the field looking at the value of a timeless idea that could today replace your income tax bill and solve the housing crisis in one fail swoop. The forefathers of modern economics, like Adam Smith, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, all recognised the role of land and land taxation in economic theory. 19th century American philosopher and economist Henry George also started a movement of people arguing for land value taxation to replace income tax. And in 1909, in the People's Budget, Lloyd George, supported by Winston Churchill, actually got land value taxation onto the statute books, although it was struck down by landowners in the House of Lords. And today there's a new generation of economists and thinkers who are looking at land value taxation again, but you won't find it in any economic textbooks. And the reason for that is a bit of a mystery. Land-based taxes are easy to collect and they're hard to avoid because land doesn't move around like economic activity. And land value taxes can also be used as an incentive to drive economic development in cheaper, poorer areas, which spreads economic growth. And taxing the unimproved value of land doesn't drag on economic activity at all. It only drags on unproductive landowners. And there's a bit of a problem with that. You see, land value taxation is politically unpopular because property ownership, speculation and finance are cornerstones of 20th century economic policy. And anything that slows down the property market tends to be a vote loser for politicians. But more importantly, landowners and banks have been riding a public policy gravy train for years and land value taxation would almost certainly derail it. For example, 40% of the EU budget, around 42 billion euros, goes each year to subsidise landlords for unproductive farmland. And in the UK, around £9 billion of taxpayers' money winds up in private landlords' pockets through housing benefit. And also in the UK, around 600,000 plots of land with planning permission are owned by developers who are speculating on land values rather than building the homes we so desperately need. Land is like a wealthy game of real-life monopoly that's reaped huge 
huge profits for landlords and the banking sector. And fiscal policy, it seems, is geared up around our taxes benefiting them rather than their taxes driving economic growth and benefiting us. Mainstream economists will point at land value tax experiments around the world and say that it's ineffective and it raises a lot more money in theory than it does in practice. But there can be no doubt that land and its taxation are a missing piece of the current fiscal jigsaw puzzle. Except it's not really missing. The politics of the 20th century and the influence of wealthy landowners simply buried it. How difficult is land value tax to collect? Well, it, it's difficult in a country like the UK because we haven't collected any data on changes in land values, certainly domestic property, since we last revalued re council tax in, in 1991. And, <laughs> and also uh, because just don't know actually who owns quite a lot of the land in the UK. As we were discussing earlier, there's certain complex financial arrangements, there's companies owning plots of land so that individuals don't get taxed on it. And there's been very little effort by the government to really find out who, who really does own land. Um, but I think in the age of big data, you know, yes. and, and technology, I don't think it would be that difficult to get a better record of who owns what and to record how it changes uh, over time. And, and those are the things you'd need to implement a land value tax. How do you begin to implement it? Do you start in the political realm? Do you start winning hearts and minds with the public? You've got to start in the political realm, I think, because economists, you know, from both left and right actually basically are in agreement that land value tax is probably the most sensible and efficient form of taxation out there. And they've made all the economic arguments and they've basically fallen on deaf ears. But remarkable that you can, A, get two economists to agree on anything, yeah. but remarkable <laughs> that you can get economists from the left and right to agree that this is a good tax. Yeah, it appeals to the, to the right, to the, the free market economists, because it's not, not about product, uh, taxing productive activity and taxing effort and work. It's and, about and income. And income. It's about taxing unearned uh, income, rentier incomes, and it appeals to those on the left, I think, because it addresses wealth inequality pretty, pretty head on. What we say in the book is that land value tax would be one part of the solution. Right. But it, absolutely key to what we, we're arguing in the book is that you've got to break this link between the banking system and land and house prices and the fact that in the UK, for example, over 50% of all lending is actually mortgage mortgage lending. It's not, it's not loans to businesses, productive It's, it's eye-watering amount. And the, the perverse incentive that banks have to basically collateralise their loans against land, because land is, very, is fixed, the same reasons it's unique, makes it attractive to banks. So you've got to break that feedback loop between more credit and more purchasing power flowing into land, increasing prices, enabling more consumption, propping up the economy. You'd have to do it carefully, you'd have to do it slowly, you'd have to have different types of banks, for example. We propose have breaking up RBS into a, uh, a number of, you know, 200 local banks, citizens' banks, that are focused on lending, building relationships with small businesses. Um, that's, that's the kind of radical step you'd have to take. But is it radical? What you're arguing for is a decentralised banking system which is anti-fragile by, by its very nature. Um, now, I you know, play a small violin for a lot of the bonuses that aren't going to be paid to the head honchos there at the moment, but ultimately you're getting real activity in the real economy moving again. Looking back in time, something like this has, political, has had political challenges because, like you say, um, this is really what keeps the show on the road in terms of uh, economy that, that is fueled by banking and property. Um, but going back to what we said earlier, it does seem now that the tipping point has been reached and I think this does have the potential to make political traction. Because what we're seeing now for the first time is that outright ownership of, uh, of homes has actually overtaken mortgage home ownership. So there's more people that own property outright without debt than there is mortgage ownership. At the same time, private renting has overtaken social renting. And so we're kind of seeing the, the 19th century land economy reassert itself, where on the one hand you've got those who just own it outright and are benefiting from all this economic rent. On the other hand, you're paying, you have an increasing numbers of people who are actually paying uh, into that system. Uh, and I think there's a real political opportunity here to bring in this debate to say, you know, these issues aren't going away anytime soon. They're actually reaching a critical point here. Uh, and if we're going to address this and we're going to actually do something about it and have a 21st century economy that actually works properly, then we're going to have to address these issues. As we can include um, bringing land back into the economic calculus and treating it as a unique factor of production is that that's your basic thesis here is that mm. right yeah how do you start doing that 
there's a number of ways you need to do it. There's, there's you know, teaching, teaching economists doing undergraduate economics that land is a unique factor of production, which we don't do at all. People will hear that at home now and go, what? Yeah. Non-economists will go, what? They don't, they don't teach people that land is a factor of production at all, let alone unique. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that is a, a major issue. That's the sort of start of the problem because the consequence of that is that policymakers are also rather blind to these issues that we've been, we've been talking about. You know, the Treasury, there isn't any civil servants looking at the land issue, the dynamics of land. The, the Bank of England doesn't have people looking at it. And also the national accounts don't properly reflect the value of land uh, in terms of savings and, and wealth. So if you take capital gains mainly from property out of that, you see that actually the ratio hasn't been increasing. So that increase in savings and paper wealth has not been matched by an in increase in productive investment. And that's, we think, one of the main reasons why productivity is actually flatlining, is that that increase in wealth is not being matched by a proper increase in investment. Josh is absolutely right. The educational aspect, particularly within the economics profession, land has really been left to other disciplines. So it is, it is taught in things like geography and other disciplines, but not in the way that we're talking about it. That, that needs to be given focus in the economics discipline. The other thing that I think is really important is because it's so vital to some of these huge issues, the housing crisis just now, inequality, um, intergenerational divide, these are some of the biggest challenges and they're ripe for politicisation. And they already are being politicised. We're seeing a growing numbers of people who are, you know, generation rent, who are, who are really sort of mobilising on this. And I think we need to be communicating, making, making clear that land is absolutely central to these issues. And I think that eventually, you know, we will see this grow and grow and grow. It's an issue that is not going away and it's only going to get worse. And I think that as communicators as well, we, want, we, we need to be making people aware that land is relevant to these issues, that it's not something that's simply left to the sort of, you know, the, the agricultural farmer fields of decades ago. This is the central issue of the 21st century. Guys, thank you very much. Congratulations on the book. Congratulations also to Toby. Um, and really well done, like, massive effort. Thanks. That's it from Renegade Inc. HQ this week. You can drop the team a mail, studio at renegadeinc.com or tweet us at Renegade Inc. Join us next week for more insight from those people who are thinking differently. But until then, stay curious. Mm -hmm.